so Luther, I think, gave us the formula for how to handle these things. It's you stand on Scripture alone and let the chips fall where they may. We're on the we're on the same side. We may disagree on, on certain theological issues, yeah, but, I, but I, we're I, on I, the I, same I, side. No, not at all. And, and look how nice we are to each other. Yeah. No, I enjoy this and uh, appreciate all you do out there for the Lord. Yeah. It's like you know what. What are you doing? You're spending all your time trying to destroy another Christian because you don't understand what's going on when you should be out there winning people for Jesus. Uh, we're not supposed to be lion sheep. We're supposed to be Koreans. And so just to, no matter who it is, this goes for everybody. Um, you're, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of yours. I'm a big fan. <laughs> It's it's true. I I love watching you, and I love hearing what you have to say, and I think you're a, a great blessing to the body of Christ. Welcome, everybody, to this week's episode of Conversations with Jeff. I'm really excited. We've got uh, Pastor and Dr. Mike Spaulding, I believe, right? You've, you've got a doctorate as well, right? I, I do, Jeff. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that's a whole story. That's another story. <laughs> Maybe we'll cover sometime. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, well welcome welcome to the podcast. I'm glad, glad we could finally sit down. It's you, this conversation has been something I've, I've, I've been really looking forward to for quite a while, and I'm glad we were finally able to to make it work. Yes, amen. Me too, Jeff. We've we've tried to make it work in the past, and it's like, well, you know what? You're busy. I'm busy, and mm -hmm. things just get in the way. And but now we're doing it, so that's great. Yes, yes, exactly. So as I do with everybody, the first time I have them on the podcast, I'd love to hear your testimony, how God saved you, and and just your story. Yes. Yeah. Well, I was saved in. 1983. So some of your listeners are, are, are going to say, I wasn't even born in 1983. Well, I wasn't I, born in 1983. <laughs> <laughs> so over 36 years ago now, and, and let me tell you something, those 36 years have just flown by. It's, it's just unbelievable. Uh, my wife and I were both saved within a, a, a couple of months of one another. And and that whole situation, let, let me let me tell you, um, she and I were living together. I had just got out of the military. I was not looking for any. I, I wasn't saved. I wasn't looking for any kind of long term relationship. I just wanted to get out, unwind and see what life had for me. That that was basically my mindset. And the Lord brought her and I together, and and we ended up living together. And um, as lost people do, right? Yep. And uh, the Lord started talking to me, Jeff. He started talking to me, and he started bringing conviction into my life. And he said, I'm not pleased with the way you're living. Now, this went on for a few weeks, and I tried to ignore it. How many of you know watching us, you can't ignore the Lord when, when he starts calling you. He hasn't called the hound to heaven for nothing. Mm -hmm. He's not going to leave you alone. And he didn't. And so I remember I, I told, uh, told my wife, I said, we can't live like this anymore. And she said, what are you talking about? And I said, God's not pleased with this situation, us living together. We're not married we've got to stop this. And, and Jeff, I kid you not. She said, God told you that, huh? I said, yeah, <laughs> he did. And she said, I'll tell you what. Well, the first thing she said was this. I almost forgot the funniest part of the whole testimony. Mm -hmm. She said, oh, God told you that. And I said, yes. And she said three words. What's her name? And I said, no, seriously, <laughs> it's, not, it's not that at all. God is telling me it's time to change. And yeah. she said, so So she called my bluff, as she tells it, her, her testimony. She, she says, well, I called Mike's bluff. If God's talking to you, guess what? Now, this was in um, mid to late November of the year. 
She said, if God's talking to you, guess what? We're going to start going to church and we're going to hear from him together and find out if this is true. So as lost people do, we made a New Year's resolution. OK, January, we're going to start going to church. So yep. we did. And, you know, four months later, she got saved. Five months later, I got saved and we got married. And it's been over 36 years now. Uh, we've got four grown daughters, um, five grandchildren, and a sixth, hallelujah, praise the Lord, a sixth grandchild due in December. So we're, we're looking forward to that. There's a gap between the grandchildren. The, the youngest current grand, granddaughter is eight. And so this will be a brand new baby that we get to get to hold and love on and spoil and all of those good things. Um, so after I got saved, the Lord put a passion, a, a burning desire, just an insatiable thirst to know his word. And and I look back on that now, Jeff, and I understand that was a baptism of the Holy Spirit. I understand what that was now. I, I've understood it for a while, but at the time, I didn't get it, but I do now. And that baptism of the Holy Spirit came with gifting, gifting for teaching and for studying, for expounding upon the Word of God. And so I've been a Bible teacher uh, almost my whole life. And uh, I've been blessed to plant two Calvary Chapel churches. Um, we were at the first one for a little over four years, and, and the Lord uh, took us to Chicago. I'm, I'm, I live in Ohio from here originally. Mm -hmm. The Lord moved us out, took, it to, took us to Chicago for, for my job. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm one of those pastors that actually works a full-time job. I don't. Yeah. I, I don't draw a salary from the church. I actually work to support me and my family and have always done that. And so the job took us to Chicago. We were there a short time. We came back to uh, Ohio. We had some people approach us and said, listen, and this was from a, from the city I'm in now, Lima. I said, would you consider coming to Lima and, and planting another church? And I got to tell you something, Jeff. That was not anything that was on my mind at the time. I just wasn't thinking along those lines, but I said, you know what, Lord, if that's what you want me to do, I'll do it, but you're going to have to tell me and show me that's what you want. Well, so we went into a season, three or four months of prayer, and it seemed like every week there was something else that he confirmed. And and so we yielded to that call and we came to Lima and, and, and we planted a, another church. And that was um, a little over 14 years ago now. So I've been a pastor for, for 21 plus years, uh, been a Bible teacher for longer than that, um, and uh, I've just been very blessed to be able to, to write. God has given me an ability, a talent to write uh, on top of everything else that I'm doing. Um, he has given and a passion and a desire and a keen eye. This is, this is something that I've learned because, um, and I was talking to uh, uh, to another pastor in Pennsylvania about this the other day. And I said, you know, I don't write just to write. I write when I'm inspired. And the Lord usually speaks directly to me and he gives me, here's the title and here's the thesis or here's the theme or, or here's the springboard or the launching pad that I want you to use for this article. And I'll take that, Jeff, and I'll sit down and five or six pages, 10 pages later, I've, I've cranked out an article that is, is solely attributed to the Holy Spirit, because with a title and an idea and you take off, that's God's stuff right there. That's God's stuff right there. So, and of course, I'm, 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 I've got three books that I've, uh, that have been blessed to publish, and, I, and I'm excited about this book project that you're heading up called Social Injustice, and I know we're going to mm -hmm. touch on that during our conversation today, yeah. um, but uh, you've put together a great team of uh, writers, pastors, apologists, um, people with a keen understanding of the world, the times that we live in, and they know exactly what needs to be said to believers and to unbelievers, because listen, not every unbeliever, not every lost person out there has their fingers in their ears. There are lots of people that are searching for the truth. They want to know, 
is there a God? And if there is, what is he like? And they are begging for people to tell them about the one true biblical God. And, and that is a great honor and a privilege that we have today, Jeff, in the days that we live in. Yeah, oh, yeah. I 100% totally agree. And I think, I, think, I think for me, looking at this, this concept of social justice and which this book that we're all kind of all contributing to and putting together and that sort of thing, I feel like historically the church has always looked at, okay, let's, let's confront these issues that are outside of the church. Let's confront, you know, whether it's democratic issues or liberal issues or whatever it is. But I feel like we have right now, we're at this point where we need to fix what's going on inside the church. So that way we can all be unified when we're going out and preaching the gospel. Because right now there's yeah. so much chaos everywhere. It's it's just nuts <laughs> when yeah, you're looking yeah. at everything that's going on. Yeah, you're right. And uh, thank you for that. And listen, folks, we didn't plan this. We, we just we jumped on here and said, hey, we're going to talk about this and, and uh, record yeah. off and running. So this was, exactly. not, this was not a softball lob to me. But I will say this. My, the first book that I wrote, Jeff, Make the Pulpit Great Again. Mm-hmm. I, 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 play, I took that off of President Trump's uh, whole campaign, hashtag M-A-G-A, Make America Great Again. And as I thought about that again, the Lord gave me the title and he gave there's so hashtag M-T-P-G-A, Make the Pulpit Great Again, mm-hmm. 12 Things Christians Can Do Right Now. He gave me the title. He gave me the chapter headings. I was jotting them down as fast as I could write, Jeff. And then within a couple of months, I had this thing cranked out. Now, it's not a long book. It's 100 and, well, I think it's 180 pages um, in, the, in the current edition. Um, but it deals with things that churches need to do. We need to start with our pulpit, Jeff. If yeah. the church is going to get straightened out, we've got to straighten out our pulpits. We've got to straighten out our past. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, we need to come alongside of pastors and encourage them in boldness, encourage them to be bold and courageous and preach the whole counsel of the word of God. As Billy Graham, I think it was Billy Graham that said this. He said, we should be preaching with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. We should be preaching the headlines from a biblical worldview perspective and addressing what's going on in the world from the biblical perspective. That's the kind of preaching that can impact a culture and turn a nation around. And we desperately need that today, Jeff. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. And, and what's interesting is because I come from the come, I grew up in the John MacArthur crowd and, you know, where it was very verse by verse expositional preaching which was great because you learn a lot of theology, you learn a lot about God's word, and it's it's really important. But at the same time, there was a lack of that preaching what's going on in the world around you from a yes. biblical perspective. And I wonder if not, and I'm not trying to blame all this on MacArthur by any, by any means, but just this issue itself of when you have a lot of people that aren't preaching about what's going on in the culture and what's going on in the world and that sort of thing. I wonder if that kind of helped cr- to create this vacuum of where we're at now with social justice, where the church just seems so shocked and surprised that this has infiltrated the church. But these guys have their roots in so deep now with social justice. I wonder if to a certain degree, that's why to, to a certain degree, why we are where we are right now. Well, I, I believe that it is. And, and, and I don't know. I don't know what to attribute that development to Jeff. Uh, because what you're describing, great expositional preaching, but there's no application. Right. There's no application. It's like you're giving people a ton of information, very interesting information, a lot of fantastic trivia. But what impact does it have and what difference does it make? And how am I supposed to put this in my toolkit when I go to work on Monday and I talk to my coworkers? How am I supposed to take what you gave me on Sunday and use that to answer their questions? Because they're not really interested in trivia and background. I call it color commentary. That, that's not helpful to them. What they want to know is how can they talk to their trans nephew? Yeah. How can they talk to their lesbian neighbor? How can they talk to the, to the guy down the street that's dealing drugs? 
That's what they want to know. How can I engage these people with the gospel that's going to impact them and change their outlook? Because what it boils down to, Jeff, is this. People have a worldview. Everybody has a worldview. And that worldview is going to logically and necessarily lead to certain behaviors. How you view uh, eternity. Is there a life after this is going to impact how you live this life? What happens to us when we die? What's our purpose here? All of those Biblical worldview questions have answers that are satisfying and will direct a person, once they understand a biblical answer, will direct a person in their behavior toward God, not away from God. So the point that I'm making here, folks, is that biblical exposition, it's wonderful, but without application, without showing and telling and teaching and using modern illustrations that if, because folks, and, and if there are any pastors out there listening to us, Jeff, I want to speak a word to them right now. Mm -hmm. Your parishioners are asking questions of somebody. If they're not asking you, they're asking somebody, do you really want to entrust other people to answer these life-changing questions? I think it's time for pastors to be equipped and prepared to answer questions questions that will engage and equip their congregants to have impactful lives for the gospel. What do you think, Jeff? I, again, I feel like I'm saying this over and over, but I 100% agree, <laughs> agree with you, you know, uh, you know, I, it, what, what's really interesting is that, again, when, when we're looking at the landscape of the church, we're looking at the landscape of, of a lot of this false doctrine and false teaching that's been infl infiltrating the church, you know, you, you were having at least some of the guys that are into the expositional preaching and that sort of thing kind of trying to refute a lot of this that's coming in. But I feel like to a certain degree, a lot of them are uneducated on the actual implications of the teaching. Like they may get the theological perspective right. They may get, you know, social justice is wrong because of this verse, this verse, this verse. But at the same time, they're completely missing it, like you were saying, with what do you do when you're dealing with having a gay nephew? What are you doing? Like, are you just going to completely shun them? Are you going to come aside, alongside them and love them? What's the practical steps? And I think that's kind of what's missing to a certain degree amongst the backlash against social justice is like, what do we do? Yeah, yeah. And it's very disheartening for me, Jeff, to see um, – to see guys, men whom I have uh, appreciated over the years, uh, their ministries, um, kind of circle the wagons and kind of support each other in their error because they've always been quick to point out error in other people. But when it comes to their, their, I don't even know what I would call it, their click. Yeah. Or as, as, as I like to say, their good old boy club. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's good. Yeah, the good old boys club. Um, it's like they they kind of just uh, ignore it and, and let it pass. And it's like, but your whole ministry is on the line here. Uh, the, the authenticity of your ministry. Are you not going to point that out because they're your friend? Ah, I think you got to be consistent mm -hmm. and. You've got to honor the Lord in your ministry. Friendships, listen, friendships will weather storms. A yeah. brother, if you approach them correctly, um, they'll receive it. But if you continue to act like nothing's wrong, you're doing a disservice to the body of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, and what's interesting about that, too, is that I feel like the, the pastor's job and their primary role is to not only preach to the church and train them, but it's also to protect them from the false doctrines and the false heresies and that sort of thing. So when you allow your friendships to, let's say, override your responsibility to protect the flock and protect the church, I feel like you're, you're really opening up your people to a lot of false doctrine and a lot of heresy just because you, you're like, I don't want to I don't want to attack my friends. Yes, and it's yes, yeah. it, it's really scary that that's at the point where we are now, where some of the biggest name people and some of the people that we've always said are the final stand against error are the same guys now that are like, well, it's my buddy. I'm not going to go against him. 
yeah yeah that's right it's it's almost like um uh, let, let me let me say it this way they've created a brand the ministry is now a recognized brand and they have to protect the brand at all costs yeah the ministry has a it, it, it it's going to move forward in into perpetuity and we've got to maintain that so we'll we'll gloss over you know smooth over the rep because after all they've been faithful for 30 or 40 years so shouldn't we be cutting them some slack today since when do we cut error slack yeah. what, what is that that's not something that we should be entertaining jeff yeah, well, you know, what, what's really interesting is that when a lot, a lot of the guys that are coming from the more reformed crowd and that sort of thing, when they were going after the charismatics and when they when they were going after them with the whole strange fire thing and that sort of thing, the call was, why aren't the charismatics policing their own? They need to police their own and then get rid of the excessive people, the guys that are preaching the false doctrine and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But then when it comes to social justice, these same guys, it's like. We're not going to police our own because it's our friends. Okay. I mean, it's it's like this double standard that I just I don't I don't get how it just doesn't click. Like, oh, maybe I should <laughs> confront this guy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely true. And I'm I'm one of those now. Calvary Chapel is is not a a a flaming charismatic movement. But we do believe that the gifts of the Spirit are in operation today. They have not ceased. We're not cessationists at all. Mm -hmm. right. um, but but I am quick to critique and and criticize the the uh, extravagances. I'll call them that. Well, really, and no, let me be more blunt. The the false teaching and heresy of some that are thrown under the charismatic umbrella. They're not really charismatic. They're heretics is what they are, Jeff. I'll just say right. it like that. And I, this is not the time, maybe some other time we have a conversation where we're going to name names. I'll do that another time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but, but, you know, it, it, it is true. Uh, and I think, I think that when we're, when we're looking at uh, some of these double standards, it, it, to a certain degree, it becomes disheartening. And it's like, I think that that to a certain degree was kind of my inspiration of why I wanted to put together this book is it's like I wanted to, I wanted to put together this group of guys and some of which have been talking about this for years and years and years. I mean, these guys, I mean, like we've got you, we've got Brandon Howes, we've got Tom Littleton, we've got these guys, Andy Woods, even that have been talking about social justice for years. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we've got some of the more mainstream guys that are kind of jumping on the bandwagon. It's like I'd rather talk, I'd rather get the guys that actually know this inside and out and can confront this. And so that's why I'm really happy to, you know, have you on board and have Brandon on board and have these guys on board, because I feel this is this is a serious issue that we shouldn't allow this double standard to to override, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, the history of social justice can be tied back to. Uh, the the origin of the social gospel the the two were kind of melded in the beginning um, and and rightly so I mean we should be seeking a just society we should be seeking uh, a, a gospel that has an application that is going to help people it isn't just about getting them saved it's about helping them through this life. I mean, that's picture Israel, for example, living for God and 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 serving God was a was a it was an individual thing, but it was a family thing, and then it was a community thing, and and I mean, it just spread from there. The basis of of Judaism is 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 really the community, and so the and, and by the way. Uh, God preserved the chapter just for me, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> I really believe that because when you asked that, hey, what would you like to uh, to write about? And you, and you gave me the chapters. Uh, the one that popped out for me was progressive politics and the church. And I thought that's that's perfect for me. That's right in my wheelhouse because that's yeah. my interest. Um, a, a little background that I didn't share in my testimony. When I got out of the military, what I didn't say was, um, I went to work for a U.S. congressman. He, he hired me on staff. I was 
officially uh, uh, my title was aid, aid to the congressman. But really, I was I was the bodyguard. That, that's mm-hmm. pretty much what it was: keep him safe, keep him on schedule, drive him from place to place. You know, report back to headquarters and let everybody, you know, that kind of stuff. And and that was all again attributed to my to my military background. And so I, so so I had a little bit of taste of of, of politics. In fact, I was offered a, a position if I wanted to stay on. Um, his staff and and uh, moved to Washington. Uh, there were all kinds of, of perks and things that were available to me. And you know, the Lord was working even then, Jeff, because he, he impressed upon me, no, that's not the life that I have for you. And, and look at what's happened out of all this. I've been walking with him now for over 36 years, pastor for over 21 years, a Bible teacher for 35 years. So many blessings, children and grandchildren, none of that if I would have made the wrong choice. And I think God, just his providential hand guided me in that. So so the, the point is this, when you offered me that chapter, I thought, wow, that's great because I get to, I get to dig into the historical background of social justice. And really it came out of progressive politics but even before that, see, here, here's, and people, you got to get the book. Yes. Social, what, what's the website, Jeff? Social Injustice? So, so, socialinjusticebook.com. There you go. Socialinjusticebook.com, yep. folks. You got to get the book. My chapter, so progressive politics was a thing. He came in at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was a champion. Teddy Roosevelt was a, I mean, he ran in the progressive party. But even before that, Jeff, even before that, progressivism, progressive theology had become a thing. And that's attributable to Darwinian evolution that came in. That was attributable to humanism and some of the uh, psychological theories and philosophies, especially of William James and his pragmatism. Now, you can see where that's leading. So James's pragmatism easily uh, uh, applicable to social justice and a social gospel. And so all of those things came together and it's just like a perfect storm. I'm not, listen, there's a lot more that you're going to get in my chapter and in the entire book. So I'm not really giving you a lot. I'm giving you a teaser here. Yeah. So it came together in a perfect storm. But along the way, it's been hijacked. It's been hijacked by Marxists and communists. We, we we use socialism a lot today. Listen, socialism is the half step to communism. The goal is communism. Complete tyranny and centralized control of every facet of life. That's the goal. That's what we're facing today, Jeff, in the church. And that's why this book project is so important and so timely for the church today. Yeah. Now, now why do you think that a lot of these leaders, let's say guys that are in the Gospel Coalition, guys that are part of the SBC, you know, guys within that crowd that are essentially ushering in social justice into the evangelical church, do you, do you feel like they either... Is, is it that they don't understand or is it that they know what they're doing and they're bringing it in? And I, that, I keep going back and forth on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, I'll tell you, I've, I've wrestled with that myself, Jeff. I want to believe that they're just stupid. That's what I want to believe. Mm-hmm. But these are men, many of them very credentialed educated. Now, I'm not saying that that, that that is the equivalent of being Holy Spirit led, because obviously it isn't. Right. But you would think on the surface that they would know better. You mm-hmm. would think that they would see the the disconnect, the 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 dichotomy between the, the, the two. They don't go together at all. And the only way that you can get them together is to force them together through a false gospel. So this has been coming for a long time. Again, progressive theology started with 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 the Beechers 
uh, started with the, the Washingtons, the Gladdens, and the Abbots, and all these guys, these, these very popular New England preachers in the late 1800s and the early 1900s that began to adopt theistic evolution. They began to adopt um, pragmatism, humanism disguised as a social gospel, they began to adopt that. Now that's spread and spread and spread and it's grown in the church to now we have people, well, we have people that deny the blood atonement, the vicarious substitutionary atonement of the Lord Jesus. They call it the most, it was, is uh, what's the term sweet used? Um, cosmic barbarism. Mm -hmm. That's what he called Christ's sacrifice on Calvary. Cosmic wow. Cosmic child abuse, cosmic mm -hmm. child abuse. So does it any wonder that these guys you've, you're describing, Jeff, if they've been influenced by by the Brian McLarens, by the Leonard Sweets, by the 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 Rob Bells, by uh, the Doug Pagets, by all of these guys in the last 30 years. Is it any wonder that they're not seeing the danger. It, it, I, I know it, it blows your mind to think these guys should know better. Yeah. The, apparently, it's a, it's a demonic deception or blindness, and, and, and maybe it's, maybe it's on us, Jeff. Maybe we should approach it this way. Well, why should we think that people who have these big ministries and they've been very successful in the world's eyes? Because they've they've got huge campuses, they've got large congregations, they write books, they speak at all the top-notch conferences. Well, they can't be wrong, can they? Well, maybe that's our issue for looking at them like that and saying, you know what, they put their pants on just like me. They got the same spirit of God that I've got in me, and he's showing me and telling me that's wrong. They're an error. And I think it's our responsibility, even though... This is a beautiful picture, Jeff. We've just talked our way to the solution to this. Yeah. God always uses the no names and the nobodies to speak to those who think they're somebody and tell them you're an heir. That's what he's doing with us, isn't it? He's yeah. using us. We're listening. We're obeying. And we're telling those folks. And I could name them all. Well, we will in the book, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and. and you already named one of the one of the central organizations, the Gospel Coalition. Is is they need to rename that because that's not what what they're advancing now is not the gospel. Right. And 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 Russell Moore and 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 and, and uh, uh, David Platt and Tim Keller and I could get well. I need to stop because I'm going to just start naming them all. I'm going to yeah. start naming them all. Um, that's not the gospel. And and if, you know, folks out there right now, they're getting mad at me and saying, well, who are you? That's not that's not the point. It isn't a matter of who I am. I'm a nobody, but I'm a nobody that knows somebody. And I know that what they're teaching is an error. And I can show you biblically that it's an error. And social injustice, the book dot com. Go order that book when it gets out. You'll want it because you're going to have a primer. You're going to have a primer that's going to answer every one of those objections. If you're one of those people that thinks, oh, no, I think we should be uh, involved in social justice. And I think all these organizations and all these people that you're bad mouthing, they're doing the right thing. You won't think so after you read the book, because I can yep. tell you something. And I really uh, I've had Thomas Littleton on my uh, on my live show before, Jeff. And 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 he has that man has done his research. Oh, yeah. Thomas has done his homework. He knows exactly what he's talking about, and he's exposed all this. And of course, Thomas is a is a is a credentialed, ordained Southern Baptist uh, minister, and um, so he has access to a lot of the the convention, well, the convention meetings, but also the convention communications and things that go out. So, you've got an all star lineup here of basically. Uh, a bunch of nobodies, according to the world. Right. And I think this book is going to have a huge impact. I really do. Yeah, I've, I've, I've already read Tom's chapter, and it, it's, it's probably one of the most well-researched book or chapters I've, I've read in the longest time. I mean, he, he just lays it out. Everything's documented. Everything is just, 
here's the facts, here's the whatever. I mean, he he, I, he did a great job just, just laying out his case. And he's going to be tackling the LGBTQ issue within the church, which is right up his wheelhouse with uh, oh, yes. dealing with revoice and all and all that kind of stuff. So yes. Um, well that's yeah. that's encouraging to me. That's awesome. Yeah, that's yeah awesome. definitely. So yeah. so I you know so, something that I did want to ask you though is part is when we're when we're looking at associations and you know whether it's being a part of organizations like the Gospel Coalition or speaking at similar conferences with other people and that sort of thing. I feel like that has kind of caused some of this confusion that we're having in the church of you know You've got, I mean, again, I don't want to name too many names, but we've got Tim Keller, who's one of the co-founders of the Gospel Coalition. I feel like everybody, to a certain degree, agrees Tim Keller's a problem. But then you've got virtually every single person is partnering with him in ministry. And then you've got, you know, pastors conferences and things like that, where we're partnering with people that are social justice warriors. And it, it's like, should we completely separate from them? Should we not? Where is, where is the confusion? Where is the clarity in all this? You know what? That is a fantastic question, and I'm not sure that I have an answer for that, uh, to be perfectly frank, Jeff, because do we stop at, uh, do we maintain friendships, although we tell them I disagree? I mean, is is that the godly thing to do, is say, listen, I love you as a friend, and I do believe you're saved, but boy, I couldn't disagree with you more about your theology and the direction this is going. Is that possible for us to do, uh, to maintain a friendship, even though we disagree on theology, and, and, and let's just name this subject, even though we disagree on social justice? Or do we say, well, I can't be friends with you, and I can't appear on stage with you, but I'll be friends with a friend of yours. So if I remove myself once, mm -hmm. is that enough? Or do I have to be removed two times from you? So a friend of a friend, I can be a friend with mm -hmm. of you. But so what's the answer? Yeah. I think the answer is follow your conscience, follow your conscience. But you need to understand in doing that, there are going to be some that say you shouldn't associate with them at all. And if you do, you're going to receive some criticism and you're going to need to learn to live with that if that's your choice to continue to associate with those that we've been naming here. Me personally, I would not associate with them. That's my personal conviction that I would just remove myself from that and explain why. Um, unless you've got, unless you've got a golden opportunity and I'll give you an example of this. I remember uh, it's been several years ago now, um, Ravi Zacharias and, and Ravi's got his own issues. Yeah. Uh, but Ravi Zacharias went into the Mormon tabernacle in, in Salt Lake City. Man, he got roasted. I mean, he got roasted for appearing there. And it's, people said, what are you doing? And he said, I took the opportunity to go in there and give him the true gospel. And I listened to his message and he did. Mm -hmm. because, because he told him, you and I do not agree on who Jesus is and on what the gospel is. And he laid it out for him. And I, I applaud him for that. But it, but he took some heat for that, for doing that. So my point is, you're going to get criticized whether you maintain a friendship, don't appear with them, maintain a friendship, do appear with them, maintain a friendship once removed. It's... It's all in the eye of the beholder, Jeff, and I, I don't have a, I'm, I apologize, I don't have a solid answer, except for me. My conscience says, don't do it. If I was that, well, <laughs> let's face it, it'll never happen. But <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I was asked to, to appear on a stage with Tim Keller, David Platt, Russell Moore, Al Mohler, any of those folks, I'd say, wow, do you need some comedic relief or what why are you asking me to do that and then i'd say but but thank you no i'll, I'll pass on that yeah. um but that's me mm -hmm. right so you know in, in you know with your chapter being on progressive politics and in the church and that sort of thing there are a lot of parallels between what we're seeing in like secular politics and what we're seeing happening within the church you know and i feel like for whatever reason 
Donald Trump seems to be that central figure that's a, that's really polarizing people in the church and outside the church. I mean, do do you do you feel like how how much of an impact do you feel like his presidency has had even on the the Christians within let's say let's just again say the Gospel Coalition or some of these social justice guys? Do you feel like that's kind of like that been that turning point of how all of, all of this exploded? Yeah, well, I, I think it has, and and, and here's the reason, Jeff. Um, I think the Trump presidency has exposed those leftist progressives that that weren't known or called that the the Tim Kellers and the Platts and the the Devers and all these guys, all the anti-Trumpers or the the never Trumpers, mm-hmm. um, ha- having their having their secret meetings at Wheatland College to discuss a strategy on how we can take back the evangelical movement from the from the Trump support and all this kind of stuff. The, the the arrogance and the presumptuousness of that is appalling to me. To right. think that that you've been ordained by God to lead a movement away from support for a sitting president. Where were you at in the eight years of President Obama? I didn't see hear a squeak out of any of you. Could it be because you supported his policies? Well, I think yeah. we're finding out now. So so the point is that that. The Trump presidency has exposed the leftists among us that are that are ministering under the the banner of Christ. And and I think this has been a good thing because it gives us an opportunity as as evangelicals who believe in the authority of the scriptures, who believe in the the inerrancy, the infallibility, who who believe that there is a right way to teach the scriptures and to minister to this culture, it gives us that opportunity to to make that contrast, to show, listen, these folks are off base and here's why. Because that's exactly what they're trying to do to us, Jeff. They, mm-hmm. They're trying to take, they're trying to take Christianity left, and I mean left into socialism, which again, as I said earlier, is a half step away from communism. Socialism is 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 just a holding area until full communism comes in. If you want to find out what that is, all you got to do is do your research. It's out there, but it never well. Venezuela, mm. one word. Venezuela. You want to see what communism does? And still, we have people here in America, Jeff, that say, "Oh no, it would be great. It would be great because they've 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 drunk the Kool Aid." that it's all about community and everybody sharing equally and resources and there'll be no more disparity. And listen, the only time there'll be no disparity and no hatred and no greed and no envy is when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. That's when all of those issues of the human heart will disappear. That's the only time. You cannot establish a moral utopia on earth absent a redeemed, regenerated heart from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's never going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. What's really interesting is that because you were kind of bringing this up a little bit, but, um, you know, like my chapter in the book is on income inequality. And so that that's been the topic that I've been, you know, really researching and, you know, writing about and that sort of thing. And it's like, as you're looking at it, what's interesting is I feel like I'm taking a slightly different approach than uh, most other anti-social justice guys take in the sense of there is income inequality and it is growing. But but the problem is that is that the progressives are providing a different a, a wrong solution. That's the problem. Like the problem is the problem is the progressive politics. It is the progressive policy policies. Just look at California. This is where yes. I live. It's nuts out here. I mean, you can have extreme wealth and then extreme poverty, like a third world country, within five minutes of each other. It's, yes. it's nuts. And so the thing is, is that we need to, we need to remember that you're never going to have everybody is going to have equal outcome. And that's the important thing that we have to remember is that we can't allow even our pastors to be saying, oh, income, income inequality is a problem or in the sense of this is something that we need to fix because – some people are successful, some people are not. If you want more money, better yourself, get a better job, 
start a business. Like to me, that's what we as the church should be promoting and pushing, not we need to take money from the rich to give to the poor, which is ultimate, ultimately communism and socialism. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So and, and you mentioned a key word, key phrase, and that is uh, equal opportunity, equal mm-hmm. opportunity. Everybody should have the same chance to succeed. And uh, and 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 we see that most clearly uh, in uh, in employment, in jobs. We should have employment laws that gives everybody the same chance at a job and the best qualified person will get the job. That's mm-hmm. that's fair. That's impartial. And, and that's part of what justice really is from a biblical perspective. It's, it's not showing partiality. God talks about that all the time. Don't be putting your finger on the weight. Don't be shortchanging your neighbor. Deal justly with people. And so income uh, inequality is one of those things. But but here's the tricky part, Jeff. What's happening with with the, the communists that have this socialism mask on, what's happening is the, the result is that they're destroying the middle class. Yep. And, 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 and that happens every time when the middle class disappeared. Listen, it is the middle class that is the economic engine of any nation. And that's especially true of America. It isn't not, yeah, the rich people, they invest, you know, the wealthy owners, they invest money, but it's it's the middle class, the small business owner that is really the, the, the economic engine of America. And if you destroy the middle class, all you're going to have is the wealthy technocrats, the, the, the oligarchy and the poor, which is exactly what's happening or happens in communism. That's what Mark, that is the end result of Marxism every time. It, it bankrupts a nation and it renders everybody. You, the disparity is if you're either rich or you're poor. Yeah. There's no middle ground. And that's yeah. a sad thing that Americans don't grasp, Jeff. Oh, yeah. You know, it, what, what's really fascinating about this conversation is that if you look back, I think it was about 2006 or so. Donald Trump wrote a book predicting that this was happening. I mean, he, he wrote the book, uh, why, we, why We Want You to Be Rich. And I, and I remember reading that book, and his whole point was that there's going to be no more middle class because of, the, because of all the progressive politics and, all, and all, of, all of the regulations, all of the taxes, all, all of just everything that's happening and the entitlements. It's either you need to, if you're middle class, you need to decide, do I want to be rich or do I want to be poor? Because there's going to be no more middle. And he predicted this, what, 15 years ago almost. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then- and then now we're, we're seeing it happen to such extreme, drastic uh, results. It's it's pretty crazy that he's actually predicted it. But now nobody gives him credit for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They've they've conveniently forgotten that, Jeff. And now one of the problems, too, is that um, we've got a runaway government. And I'm not talking about uh, spending. I'm talking about we've got a runaway uh, government in terms of corruption, corruption. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and here's an example that makes it crystal clear. You have people that go into office. Um, I don't know. I haven't looked recently. I, I don't know what the yearly salary is for a congressman or a senator. It might be maybe 200,000. I don't know. I don't think it's much more than that. Um, how do you go into the Senate and maybe you're a small business owner. A lot of them are attorneys. Mm-hmm. They're not wealthy people. They're not millionaires by any stretch. Right. They make. Some of them are. Some of them are. There are exceptions. But they go in and and they've got a couple of hundred thousand maybe in assets. And after a few terms in office, whether it's the Senate or the House, all of a sudden they're multimillionaires. Now, you can't do – I don't care who your stock investor is. You cannot turn that kind of a profit in that length of time. So here's what's happening, folks. And I know most of your listeners already know this. The lobbyists are buying America. They're buying votes. Whatever they want passed, they just grease the palms of people. I, some of our, I, I hope folks understand this, and this is not hyperbole at all. 
This is not over uh, uh, dramatizing this at all, Jeff. Mm -hmm. They go in and all of a sudden they're multimillionaires. Who do you think their allegiance is to? The constituents that sent them there or to the lobbyists and all the corporate influencers that continue to give them millions and millions and millions of dollars? Well, I can tell you it's the lobbyists. Our government yeah. is a is a is a controlled operation now. The highest bidder wins, and I I hate to say it like that, but it is the truth. Yeah, no, it it it, it really is the truth. And and what's what's really interesting is that it's it's one of those things where I feel like everybody kind of knows it, but nobody really wants to admit it because yeah. you know all, they they idolize their favorite politician or their favorite whoever it is, and it's. It's fascinating because I was just in, in Washington, D.C. last week, and it's fascinating even just being in that environment because you, you can totally tell just talking to people how much influence and power the lobbyists have. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's really interesting that uh, there's a funny thing about they have all these rules for lobbyists and how, and how much money they can you know, contribute to somebody or whatever it is. But I guess there's like a $25 um, limit to how much a lobbyist can give as a gift to a politician. Let's say they're going to take him out for dinner or whatever it is. So there's actually a restaurant right across the street from the House of Representatives that you can never spend more than $20, which is where all the politicians and all the lobbyists go because they know that they can eat there, have a nice meal, and they're not going to get in trouble for their, their lobbyist rules. But it's interesting how, how widespread the influence is with all these lobbyists. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really off the charts. And if we knew, if we really knew the truth about what happens in Washington, D.C., Jeff, I'd wager that probably 90 percent of the House and Senate would be in jail. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, that that is true. I would not be surprised at all. So, yeah. you know, so but I guess to, to bring it a little bit back to the church. Do you feel like the do you feel like it's it is intentional from the political side where they're trying to essentially make uh, make the church into a voting block for the left? Do you think that that's why we're getting the social justice crowd into the church right now? Or is it just na naivety and just like just churches just have no idea what they're doing and they're just going along with it? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of both. Uh, I think the, the movers and the shakers within the, the leftist, progressive, social justice warriors, and we've already named their names, mm -hmm. I think it's a deliberate strategy. They're, yeah. they're, they're deliberately doing this because they think that's the right thing to do, is to take this in. And, and, and it's remarkable because th there have been uh, uh, some very powerful and strong voices that have come out against this, and they've laid it out from a biblical perspective why social justice, progressivism, and all of these things are unbiblical, and yet these other folks aren't paying any attention. It's like they're they're tone deaf to the message, and so most churches today, and again, this this is uh, I, I don't say this with any uh, amount of of joy. Uh, or, or happiness at all. But most churches today, they're just trying to maintain the status quo. They're just trying to pay the mortgage. They're just trying to make sure everybody shows up and drops their offering in the, in the offering box. And they're just trying to maintain their programs and pay their pastor and, and get along with their culture. And, and it's, 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 it's almost like the, uh, uh, a, a disease has invaded the pulpit and has spread to all the congregations. Uh, and the disease is called niceness. We just want to be nice. We just want people to like us. We don't want to rock the boat. If we speak out against this, if, if we take a strong stand on, on um, pro-life, if we take a strong... Then, yeah, I don't want to get going on that. That was one thing that uh, that the social justice word uh, Mark Deaver was trying to convince people that you can be for the murder of unborn babies and still be a Christian. And I got news for you, folks. Hear me. Hear me on this. Don't miss this. You ready? No, you can't. If you deliberately support the murder of unborn human beings, you better check your faith. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm tired of messing around with people on this issue. You better check your faith, Mr. or Mrs. If you think you can support the wholesale slaughter, the suctioning out, the dismemberment of unborn babies, 
and think you're a person of faith, you better think again. Mm -hmm. Better do a self-evaluation. And you can send me all the hate mail that you want because I don't care. That's the way it is. God says that, that life begins at conception. Even before that, God knew Jeremiah in his mother's womb. Even before you were formed in the womb, God knew you. We got to get this right, Jeff. Yeah, we, we really do. And that that's one of those issues where I feel like no matter what what your view on political involvement is, like that's something that that we need to end as a country is yes. this portion. And, and and again, not not to just keep plugging the book or whatever it is, but I'm I'm real I'm really happy that we, we do have Pastor Ken Peters that's writing the chapter on abortion. And for those of awesome. you that don't know He's the founder of the Church of Planned Parenthood, and he's been really leading a big movement uh, yeah. for the evangelicals. Um, Amen. But, but this is this is one of those things where we need to be engaged in that conversation with, yes. with both Christians and non-Christians. Yes. But we sure need to make sure we're getting that right within the church. Because I mean, Amen. I used to think that, of course, there's never going to be any evangelical leader that's going to say that it's okay to vote for abortion. But now here we are, and it's like all of a sudden, it, it's it came out of nowhere. Yeah, it did. So, it did, yeah. and and it's and it it is coming full force because you see that's part and parcel. Think about this. <laughs> Excuse me, and we really haven't touched on this, but let me tell you this: Marxism, communism, progressivism, socialism. So you go from progressivism to socialism to communism, which is Marxism. All of those systems, are you ready, folks? They are anti-God. They are atheistic at the core. You talk to anybody that has lived under the thumb of communism, of Marxism, and they will tell you. Well, we shouldn't even have to debate this issue, uh, Jeff. Yeah. We should look at what's going on in China today. China is destroying Christian churches. They're arresting Christian pastors. If you don't go along to get along, they're going to hunt you down, lock you up. You may just disappear. That's communism. That's communism. And that's what they're trying to do here in America. And it's being aided and abetted by all these people that we've already named. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, what's fascinating is that we're, we're supposed to have freedom of, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of association. And, and if you notice, Every single one of those is being attacked by especially the progressives and the leftists and, and that sort of thing. But it's fascinating now that, again, we're having these, no other word, but progressive leaders that are now even supporting a lot, a lot of these bills and laws and ideologies and that sort of thing. And it's like, what was it that uh, Russell Moore said that, like, we, we lost the culture war, so we should just get along now or something yeah. along those lines? Yeah, and, yeah. And it's, it's just like... You, you, a, you never lose the culture war, but, but, at, but at the same time, we we do need to be promoting freedom because you, you look at Venezuela, you look at China, you look mm -hmm. at Russia, you look at these countries, like it's nuts over there. There is no freedom, and I think we take it. I think we take that for granted, which may be to a certain degree why all of this social justice stuff has been able to infiltrate so much is that we've taken it for granted for so long that. We, we don't we don't see the danger of it like maybe like my grandparents may have, may have seen. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> if they would have tried this stuff when our grandparents lived, no, no way. There would have been a revolution immediately. Listen, for anybody to say, well, we lost the culture war, so let's just get along. They're not part of the true church. Maybe they missed the memo from Jesus that said in the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. They cannot defeat the true church of Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't be persecuted even unto death. Many of our brethren in other places around the world are being martyred right now for no other reason than they refuse to renounce Jesus. That kind of stuff under the guise of, of Islam is coming to America. It's it's in fact here. There are many voices that are trying to warn us of, about that. And the way that I look at this, Jeff, and how this ties in is that Islam is being used uh, 
much like Marxists and communism always use what they call, I think Lenin coined this phrase, useful idiots. That's what they're using Islamists for, to bludgeon uh, Christianity, because the goal and the objective of all of this, folks, that Jeff and I have been talking about, the real goal and objective is to try and destroy true Christianity and the true church. Here's a, here's a news flash for you. Can't be done. You're never going to destroy true Christianity, and you're never going to defeat the true body of Jesus Christ. We will be here fighting the good fight until he returns. And if that means against Sharia law, against progressivism, against socialism, communism, Marxism, the gay lesbian movement, transgenderism, whatever, we'll continue to fight the good fight. And we've got the Holy Spirit in us, with us, for us, and we can win this fight. Yeah, no, that that's that's really true. And what what's really interesting is looking at at their ultimate goal. Uh, you know, what's what's really fascinating is like when you look at history, and this is something that I've kind of like been pondering and trying to figure out and work out in my mind. So tell me if I'm completely way off base, right? But historically, there's always there's always been empires that have tried to take over the world, whether it's the Babylonian Empire, uh, the Greeks, the Romans, you know, more modern, you've got Nazi Germany, you've got the British Empire, you've got all these empires, they are, they're always trying to conquer the world. And what I kind of like um, hypothesizing is that were they just were they trying to take it over? And that was going to be Satan trying to take over the world as the Antichrist. And then God's like, Nope, it's not time yet. So we're going to bring it back a little bit. And then they try it a different way, try a different way. But this may be the first time where they're actually trying to do this, where they're not trying to conquer the world through battle, but they're trying to do it from within to where eliminate borders, eliminate, you know, eliminate the, the differences in religion, create the one world currency. Like we see this all around us. This is yeah. them trying to establish the kingdom of their kingdom for the Antichrist here on earth. And then the church is doing nothing about it. It's like we're just saying, yeah, let's let's help you out. I that's mean, a that's an outstanding point, Jeff. And that's that's a very, very good point. And I would invite uh, your viewers, your listeners to do this research on their own. Here's what I would say to that. That's exactly what is happening. This is just another uh, manifestation of the spirit of Antichrist that is trying to control the entire world, trying to set up the one world government, the one world religious system. And listen, and again, you don't have to believe a word, Jeff, or I say. You can do your own research. I encourage you to prove us wrong. But I'll tell you this. The reason that we got pulled into World War I was because a group of individuals, Brits, wanted the British Empire to control the world. And they pulled America in there to try and succeed it. You can do your research out of that. Out of that. That's why... Wilson campaigned on we're not getting involved in a European war. And guess what? Within a year or so, where were we? Our young men were dying in Europe. We got pulled in. And, and this is this is why, because it was a movement for the one world government. That's what these folks wanted. What's the proof? Well, what came out of the Paris uh, uh, Peace Treaty, the, the, the Versailles Peace Treaty, was the League of Nations. The League of Nations was designed for the allies to split up and control the world and eventually consolidate. God spared us that, Jeff, because the, the U.S. Senate refused to ratify that agreement. And so the League of Nations disappeared. Well, what are we going to do now? So all of the corporate bankers and 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 and, and corporate uh, corporatists, the Fords, the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, uh, the Warburgs, all these folks, they found some guy in Austria by the name of Adolf Hitler, and they fomented and started World War II. Do you know that World War II was was intentionally started, and by the way, was funded and financed by American bankers, American industrialists. Rockefeller's companies was sending Nazi Germany oil during the war, illegal, by the way. Wow. Ford was building them vehicles over there uh, during the war, illegal 
by the way, Carnegie and many of the other companies were sending them raw materials for their for their factories to build their war machines, all illegal, by the way. You know what came about as a result of World War II? The United Nations. Mm -hmm. Wars have been about making people sick and tired of wars so that they'll unite under an umbrella of control globally. You don't have to believe any of that. The research is out there. I've read it. You can go do the research yourself. But Jeff, you, all you need to do is read Revelation 17 and 18, and it gives you the template. That's what people have been trying to do forever. And that's what progressivism, socialism, and communism is all about, to your point, which again is a very good point. It's trying to move us towards this one world religion, and they're getting some traction, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah, no, no they, they really are. It, it, but what's, what's really fascinating to me is just how the church has, get, has just thrown up the white flag to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. It's just like, yeah, let's do this. But, but I, guess, I guess the question that I have for you about that is, it's like on one hand, we want Christ to return, right? And, and we, we understand that it's all in his timing and that sort of thing. But, mm -hmm. but we do know that ultimately when this kingdom is established here on earth is essentially when Christ's return is going to be. So then, so then the question is, do, are, are, we, are we sabotaging ourselves by fighting against progressivism? So then Christ isn't going to return quite as soon? Or do, we, or do we just keep fighting and fighting and fighting and then just let, let God work it out from his end? Yeah. Well, we were commanded to occupy till I come. No man knows the hour of the day, but until he comes, we are to be fighting the good fight. We don't know. Uh, and anybody that says they do, run from them as fast as you can. <laughs> if they, people start setting dates. Don't listen to that. Eschatology, when we, we could talk about end time stuff and uh, the timing of the rapture. Some people say there, there's not a rapture. Some people say there's no millennium. Some crazy people even think we're living in the millennium right now. What? If this is the millennium, <laughs> we got yeah. ripped off. Exactly. <laughs> and, 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 and who stole my Bible and put a bunch of different stuff in there? Because it don't talk about that. I can yeah. tell you. <laughs> so so occupy till he comes. That That's our role and our job. We're supposed to be pressing the gospel and not waving a white flag, Jeff. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be bold and courageous. If God is for us, if the spirit is in us, who could be against us? And what do we have to fear? Yeah. We should be we should be out there in the streets pushing back against this darkness instead of sitting in our holy huddles every Sunday and think we've somehow served the Lord because we attend a church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, now, when we're looking, OK, how do we how do we fix this situation in the sense that I feel like we, we know, OK, clearly truth matters biblical preaching matters you know dealing with our local churches that's vitally important um but in the sense of like the, the greater overall church especially here in america right how do we how do we write this for lack of a better word sinking ship because i feel like we have this system established where you know you go to seminary in the seminaries they're going to indoctrinate you and then you're essentially also allowing 18 year old kids to decide i'm going to go into the ministry as opposed to being raised up in the church and then the church is choosing the elders and the, you know, that sort of thing. And then you've got the conference circuit, you've got the book circuit, you've got all this, this essential like ecosystem within the church. How do, how are we supposed to fix this system? Or do we just completely break apart and say, forget it. This is completely off in unbiblical land. Like what are we supposed to do? Yeah. So take it, take it one congregation at a time. And, and here's here's the seat. This this is what I think we need to do. We need to 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 change the model of church. Church. How about this? How about this? How about if on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning, instead of driving over to a building, we be the church at a truck stop nearby that's known for sex trafficking that's known for open prostitution, that's known for 
uh, drug dealing. How about if we be the church there and go through that that truck parking lot with tracks, Bibles, and a willing testimony to share with people about how they can escape the bondage and the darkness that they're in. How about if we start there? How about if we start being activists and we go to places where we know there's there's crimes committed? We know that people are trapped in poverty. How about if we go to those places instead of meeting in our holy huddles and think we've served the Lord and then go to our go to our dinners after church service and and fill ourselves full of food and say, boy, it's been a great day. God is good. How about if we go out to housing projects and start passing out food and clothing and hope, the hope that is found in Jesus Christ? How about if we be the church in some other place than the building that we call the church? If we did that, Jeff, and we encouraged other people to do it, and we started seeing people being released and freed from that bondage and, and being born again in Christ. Do you know what an ex-drug addict or an ex-alcoholic, once they've been born again, the passion they have in their hearts for drug addicts that they knew and alcoholics that they knew? Mm -hmm. You want to worry about, guys? You want to start a new mission? You want to start a new ministry? Go to the crack house. Pull somebody out of that, pray that they get saved, and then start ministering. You'd be amazed if we become activists, Jeff, because we've gotten into this model, this mold that Christianity is about going to church on Sunday and listening to a sermon, singing a few songs, giving some money, and then we're good till next week. I'd like to know how that differs in any substantial way. From going, say the the Roman Catholic goes and 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 they have they participate in the mass, and they're good for another week, and then I can go do the mass again, and then that wipes that last week out, and then I'm good for another week. How does that differ? Because there are a lot of people that criticize Roman Catholics, and I'd like to know, well, what what are you Protestants doing that's any different? How how are you doing anything different? You're just going from Sunday to Sunday and thinking, well, as long as I'm in church. I got perfect attendance and, you know, everything's good. Wrong. It's high time for Christians to be the first century church. Those guys were out in the streets every Sabbath. <laughs> every time they met from house to house, they were influencing people and they were sharing the gospel of Christ. How about if we get back to that? Do you think we'd see a change, Jeff? Yeah, no, I, for sure. I, th I think we definitely would because, because I think what, what's happened right now is just like just like we have with the government where the government's gotten way too big and way too powerful i feel like that same thing is happening in the church where we've got these christian organizations that are way too big way too powerful bringing in million multiple millions of dollars every year of course they're going to compromise because they, they're they're focused on the income coming in as opposed to the ministry uh, that's supposed to be going out and it's in i wonder if we're so focused on building individual churches into mega churches Instead of just focusing on ministering to our local church body where the pastor is walking through life with their people. Like, I feel like that's what's, to me, that's really what's missing in the church is pastors aren't really walking through life with people. You've just got an, an entertaining guy that's just up on stage and giving a motivational speech. It's like the yeah. whole, to me, to me, the whole system is just bogus, <laughs> bogus right now. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. It is. It's, it's broken. It needs fixed. And, and, I, and I'm happy to say that um, here recently, I've become aware of, of a group of people and I begin to network with them and they have the same goals, objectives and outlook as I do. And, uh, and I see some great things coming, uh, happening in the church. So folks, I don't mean to, to browbeat anybody. I'm not right. trying to, to send you into a tailspin thinking, well, I, I'm not doing enough then. I don't, now, that's not the point in this. It's to give you a different perspective. It's to help you to understand that, that Christianity is a living, a, 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 a vital faith that will, should encourage you to action. Uh, James said, 
Faith without works is dead or useless. Works demonstrates the robustness of our faith. And so going out and representing Christ uh, on the highways and the byways or wherever there's brokenness or despair, that's what it's all about. And that's what we need to be doing as the church. Get back to the first century. And I'm not talking, listen, <laughs> I've had some people, Jeff, they tell me, do you really want to get back to the first century church? Because uh, after all, you know what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. I mean, do we really want people dropping over dead when they lie? It's like, well, probably not because the church would be empty on yes. most Sundays. That's that's not my point. That's not my point at all. What I'm saying is the activism, the boldness and the courage of sharing Christ with those that are lost in despair and deception. That's what we need to get back to. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Now, now, when when you when somebody comes to you or whatever it is, and, and they say that they're starting to see this social justice creep into their church, what's your advice to them? Is it like because I feel like there's there's multiple camps. There's some people that's like, well, go find a, go find a good church. Other people would say, stay stay and try and do everything you possibly can in that local church. But what what do you feel like is the right answer, or is there a right answer? Yeah, I, I, I think it's going to depend on the situation and the person. It's, it's, it's to say every time this is what you should do, maybe you should just leave. If that's just one more thing, if that's the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back, then maybe it's time to go. But if, if, if this is the first time you've seen something that's not really biblical and it's kind of, you know, then address it. Go to the pastor not in an accusatory or an attacking manner, but just ask some questions. I, I've noticed, and, and this sounds a lot like to me, uh, uh, social justice, and just ask some questions. Maybe he doesn't even know, because I tell you, a lot of times, Jeff, pastors are just reading other pastors or other organizations' materials, and they're thinking, oh, well, that sounds good. And so they begin to teach that, thinking that it's biblical without thinking through the implications of that teaching. And then it comes out and somebody's going to say, oh, wait a minute. That didn't sound. So go to your pastor and ask him. And, and pastors, if you're watching Jeff and I and this, listening to this conversation, let me encourage you to listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to the Holy Spirit. When you're preparing your sermons, when what you're going to teach, listen to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will never lead you astray. The Holy Spirit is going to give you exactly what you need to chew on and understand, and, it, and it'll be exactly what the folks that you're going to be ministering to need to hear and understand also. So listen to the Holy Spirit. Don't rely on other organizations, printed materials, and all of this stuff. Don't do a canned sermon. I talk about that all the time, Jeff, when I have an opportunity. Do your research. Do your reading. Make sure you're praying, and then listen to the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit will lead you in what His, what God's people need to hear every time. You can trust Him. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that's I think that's the perfect way to, way to end it too, because I feel like that's like the most that that's the most important thing that I feel like we can we can all do. I mean, even even those even those of us that are not pastors, when we're when we're going or reading God's word, we we need to make sure that we're not just reading and then just moving on, but we're making sure that we're reading, we're hearing the Holy Spirit, and we are applying what we're reading to our life. And yes. that application is one of the most important things, especially today. We can't forget the application because we can have we can all have the, that theological training. We can know the Bible inside and out, but if you're not applying it, what's the point? That's exactly right, Jeff. Amen. So, well, I, I really appreciate you sitting down and, and having this conversation with me because I, I really enjoyed it. And I, and I think that, again, this is a really important uh, topic that we need to be talking about just in general and just kind of keep the conversation going about social justice just so people can keep wrestling with it. Because some people may be caught up in it and they just they just need another perspective to just kind of kind of reiterate Okay, do I need to rethink my position on this? So, yes. I really, Amen. I really, I really appreciate you coming on. I'm really, I'm really excited, really glad that you're a part of the Social Injustice Book Project as well. So, yes. Well, thank you, Jeff. I'm, I'm blessed to be a part of it, and I can't wait till it's out. I know that it's going to be uh, well received, 
And I think it's going to end up being a, 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 a book that folks are going to use as an example. Hey, if you want to learn this subject, you need to get this book, socialinjusticebook.com, right? Yep, yep. And then yep. Uh, you, you use the code Mike on the website as well, and you'll, you'll, get, a, you'll get a free audio book uh, once the book's released as well. So ma make sure you guys do that as well, because I, I, you know, I'm really excited about it. But, but the thing that I'm most excited about with this book is that we have 12 different authors all writing about their like expertise. And like, like you were saying, like, like you were so excited you got the progressive uh, politics within the church. I feel like I've been hearing that from every single author. They're like, <laughs> I never thought that I'd get this chapter. This is like my dream yeah. chapter. So it yeah. just totally yeah. worked out that way. Yeah, well, that tells you right. That's a confirmation, Jeff. It was God was in it. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. So yeah. definitely. Well, again, thank you so much. If anybody wants to follow you on social media or your website or any any of your podcasts or anything like that, how how can they do so? No, oh, well, thank you. That's that's very kind. Um, I have a live Monday show, uh, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's drmikelive.com. I, I have different people join me for all kinds of conversations. That's uh, Mondays at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. drmikelive.com. Soaring Eagle Radio is my is is really the uh, I don't even know what you'd call it. It it was the first platform. It was the first uh, podcast pre-recorded, and it goes out to a lot of different places now. Uh, our mutual friend Brandon House carries it on Worldview Weekend. It's on a, a number of different platforms. So SoaringEagleRadio.com, you can go there, and then I post um, my articles. Articles from friends on drmikespalding.com. So there's a number of different platforms that you can find me on. If you're interested in communicating with me, it's Pastor Mike at cclohio.org. That's Pastor Mike at cclohio.org. That's Calvary Chapel Lima, Ohio.org. cclohio.org. And you send me an email, and I'll do my best to, to respond back. Perfect. Sounds good. So de definitely follow him. Definitely check out his podcast and his shows and that sort of thing. And hey, we'll have to do this again sometime. I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed this. I would love it, Jeff. Thank you for the invite. Of course. Thank you so much. You're welcome. God bless.